Welcome to our session number six. It is October 21st, and I have pre-recorded this particular session. Hopefully, Lord willing, I'll be back with you in person next week, able to finish up the rest of the 12-part series. Tonight, I'm going to say again, understanding the book of Zechariah is crucial to understanding the prophetic plan of God. So if that's true, why is it so rarely studied and discussed in the church today? Because it's not easy. The New Testament authors directly quote from or allude to Zechariah's content some 40 times. Can you imagine the significance if the New Testament authors use that much emphasis on the foundation of Zechariah for what they teach in the New Testament? Shouldn't we be studying it today? It makes it one of the most quoted of all the Old Testament works. I've used several resources. They're all outlined in your outline. Tim LaHaye, Ed Henson, several resources I have used during this study. The, the reality is Zechariah reveals more about the coming Messiah than all the other minor prophets combined. You might know that's why I like the book so much. Zechariah's message is clear regarding the coming of Jesus on the present earth in the Mount of Olives, and you're going to find that out tonight. Tonight, in this study, you're going to see specific language about this present Jerusalem and the king that's coming. So tonight, we enter a second major portion of the book of Zechariah. Everything changes tonight. Uh, When we get into chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Zechariah, everything will become now uh, a new scene, a new look. So I'm going to read the first 14 verses, and then we'll kind of get inside of those 14 verses and walk around and study. On December 7th of the fourth year of King Darius' reign, another message came to Zechariah from the Lord. And let me just stop and say, why do you think in verse 1 it sets that timeline? So future generations like us can be able to date this writing. Because we have historical record of when King Darius reigned in Persia. So when it says in the fourth year of King Darius' reign, uh, you can date Zechariah's writing in this chapter. The people of Bethel sent Sherezer and Regalmelech along with their attendants to seek the Lord's favor, to go ask the Lord's question, a question. They were to ask this question of the prophets and the priests at the temple of the Lord of Heaven's armies. Now, understand something. You've got to get the context or you're going to miss it tonight. King Darius and eventually King Cyrus has releasing people back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. Seventy years they've been held captive in foreign lands. But now they're rebuilding the temple of the Lord of Heaven's armies. So these two guys are going on behalf of the people to ask the priest to ask God a question. Here's the question. Should we continue to mourn and fast each summer on the anniversary of the temple's destruction as we have done for so many years? So what are they doing? So for the last 70 years, they've been fasting each summer on the anniversary of the temple's destruction. Fasting, mourning. They've been having a a festival of mourning the fact that God took away the temple. What's the significance of God taking away the temple? God left. It's the house of God. It's the presence of God. It's not just about a glorious building. Was it a glorious building? Yeah, it was a glorious building. But it's not just about a glorious building. It's not just about a house, it's who's in the house. God's in the house. In fact, if you study the scripture in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about before Nebuchadnezzar could ever come to Jerusalem to destroy uh, the city, to destroy the temple, to set it on fire, burn down the gates of the city. Before he could do that, what do you think? God's going to just kind of huddle down back in there? No, No, God left. One of the most amazing scenes in the Old Testament is the departure of God from the Jerusalem temple. He left. Which way did he leave from? He went from the east. Which way will he return from? He'll return from the east. What's on the east of the temple? The eastern gate. What's outside the eastern gate? The Mount of Olives. 
Where did Jesus ascend from? The Mount of Olives on the eastern side of the city. So here's the question. The Lord of Heaven's army sent me this message in reply. What they've asked God, should we continue this annual uh, fasting over Jerusalem's temple destruction? Say to all the people and your priests, during these 70 years in exile, when you fasted and mourned in the summer and in early autumn, was it really for me that you were fasting? Do you ever have anybody answer a question with a question? God just answered a question with a question. During the 70 years when you've been having this annual event where you fast and mourn the Jerusalem's fall, were you really, was that for me you were fasting? And even now, verse 6, in your holy festivals, aren't you eating and drinking just to please yourself when you have your parties, these Jewish events? Are you doing that for me? You see, what's the problem? See, God looks inside our hearts. So no matter what we look like we're doing on the outside, if it looked like we're fasting on the inside, if we're on the outside, if we're not fasting on the inside, he's in on it. Was that for me? Verse 6 again, and now in your holy festivals, aren't you eating and drinking just to please yourself? Is this are you doing this for me? Isn't this the same message the Lord proclaimed through the prophets in years past when Jerusalem and the towns of Judah were bustling with people and the Negev and the foothills of Judah were all well populated? Before the destruction of the temple? Were you listening to me then? Were you doing things for me then? Before, before I had to come and bring judgment? Then the message came to Zechariah from the Lord. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies say. Judge fairly, show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. Do not scheme against each other. Your ancestors refused to listen to this message. Here's what God's trying to teach. Why are you listening? Why, what's the chance of you listening when nobody behind you has ever listened? Your ancestors refused to listen to this message. What? Do not oppress the widows. Do not oppress foreigners, orphans, the poor. Don't scheme. Stop scheming against each other. They stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. Hearing what? God's word. God's word. God's word. They made their hearts as hard as stone so they could not hear the instructions or the messages that the Lord of Heaven's armies had sent them by the Spirit through the early prophets. Now, do you think that's an issue today? They cannot hear the instruction or the messages that the Lord of Heaven's armies has sent them by the Spirit through the early prophets. That is why the Lord of Heaven's armies was so angry with them. Why? They would not listen. Was their truth revealed? Yeah. I think back of Jeremiah before, how many times did Jeremiah come preaching and teaching, repent, 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 turn back to God? They wouldn't listen. What about today? They won't listen. Do we keep speaking? Yeah, we keep speaking. Will they listen? Verse 13, since they refused to listen when I called to them, I would not listen when they called to me. Do you have that picture of God? I'm really serious about the question because a lot of people think that God would never turn his face. But the reality is, it says, since they refused to listen when I called to them. Is God faithful? Yes. Is God loving and merciful? Yes, yes, yes. We're going to see that in just a few minutes. But this is the word of God. They refused to listen when I called to them, so I would not listen when they called to me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And with a whirlwind, I scattered them among the distant nations. Who scattered them? Nebuchadnezzar? No, God said, I did. I scattered them to the distant nations where they lived as strangers. Their land became so desolate that no one even traveled through it. They turned their pleasant land into a desert. Who did? God did, but who really did it? They did it by what? Not listening. Not listening to what? The Word of God. Is the Word of God available today? Do people listen to the Word of God today? Well, you know, we're reading tonight the Word of God. I've said on numerous occasions, I wonder when we get to heaven, it'll all be this simple. Everything you ever needed to know about your life was already written down in your language in front of you, and you wouldn't listen. After the destruction of the Jewish temple in 586 B.C., the Jewish people had begun new fasts 
that were not previously practiced before the fall of Jerusalem. Now that the Babylonian captivity had ended and the temple was being rebuilt, the question was, <coughs> should we continue this ceremony? So let me re repeat verse 3. They were to ask the question of the prophets and the priests at the temple of the Lord of Heaven's armies. Here's the question. Should we continue to mourn and fast each summer and on the anniversary of the temple's destruction as we have done for so many years? I suppose 70 years. The question was never really answered, not in this context. But God redirected the question back to the people. After all, if the people had been listening to the prophets that there would have not been a 70-year Babylonian captivity in the first place to fast about. God never initiated this fast. Did God come and initiate this fast? I want you every year on the anniversary of the temple's fall to have a fast. No. The people did this. The people did it, and now they're asking if they should stop something that they themselves have started. It's still okay to ask, but God didn't start this. They did. God reveals to Zechariah the real issue. Now, we're going to go to verse 4 and 7 again. The Lord of Heaven's army sent me, Zechariah, this message in reply to the people's question. Say to all your people and your priests, during the 70 years of exile, when you fasted and mourned in the summer and in early autumn, was it really for me that you were fasting? And even now in your holy festivals, aren't you eating and drinking for you? Just to please yourselves? Isn't this the same message the Lord proclaimed through the prophets in years past when Jerusalem and the towns of Judah were bustling with people and the Negev and the foothills were, of Judah were well populated? And listen, before Babylon came and attacked Israel, Judah, the southern kingdom, this was the center of the world's marketplace. This is it. And now, years later, it's a ghost town. And God said, the message I gave you then would have kept you from becoming a ghost town now. And then a second message came regarding the question of mourning and fasting. A second message from God to Zechariah to the people. Verse 8. Then this message came to Zechariah from the Lord. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Judge fairly. What's that got to do with fasting in the summertime on the anniversary of the temple? Everything. What happened to the temple? You wouldn't listen. Why did you end up scattered? You wouldn't listen. Why did you end up in bondage in a foreign country? You wouldn't listen. Listen to what? Here it comes. Listen. Everybody, listen today. You think this has changed? Judge fairly. Show mercy. Show mercy and kindness to each other. Do not oppress widows. Do not oppress orphans. Do not oppress foreigners. Do not oppress poor people. What does it mean, oppress? To take advantage of people. Why? Why would you do that? You're stepping over them so you can rise yourself up, raise yourself up. Or you manipulate somebody so that you can get something they have. Do not scheme against each other. Well, why would you be scheming? Makes you rich. I wonder if most business practices today, scheming is part of the business plan. Why? To make you rich. Your ancestors refused to listen to this message. They stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. Was the message not available? No, the message is available. Was the word of God before the fall of Jerusalem available? The word of God was available. But you know what it looked like? It looked like this. Put your finger in your ears. And not listening. Has anything really changed in the story of man? Is the word of God available today? Yeah. Do people really want to listen? No. And what's the result of not listening over time? Look at verse 12. They made their hearts as hard as stone. You see, the more often you listen 
it's like a conditioning program of the heart. The more often you apply the Word of God to your heart, the softer your heart becomes. But the farther and the longer you stay away from the Word of God, the more hard your, hard your heart becomes. And it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder to listen when your heart is hard. That's why I look at people in the church today that have an event take place and they step out of church for a while. And after you're out of church a while, it's hard to come back in. I met with somebody just this past weekend, hadn't been in church for years. And I said, uh, when are you going to come back to church? And they looked me in the eye and had this big smile on their face. I didn't really get the smile part. But they said, I still believe. I just don't like church. And I'm wondering, are you listening? Who are you listening to? They made their hearts, verse 12, as hard as stone, and they could not hear the instruction or the messages that the Lord of heaven's armies had sent them by the Spirit through the earlier prophets. I'm not going to go back to that I was talking about a minute ago. You know, I'm convinced after reading the Bible for many years that if God's going to move in the church age, He's going to move during, through the church. If God's going to move in the church age, He's going to move through the church. So if you've got a problem with the church, you've got a problem with God. You don't have a problem with me. You don't have a problem with church. You've got a problem with its founder. And that's just the truth. And your heart's gone hard and your ears don't hear. Because if he's going to say anything, where do you think he's going to say it? Are, are there a lot of churches that have gone sour? Yeah, I, I suppose so. But you know, there's going to be some churches still standing on the last day. There's going to be some churches that are not going to compromise. They're going to be ready for the wedding on the last day. Yes, there are. That is why the Lord of heaven armies was so angry with them. Why? Because they wouldn't listen to the Holy Spirit. Look at, let me go back to 12. They made their hearts as hard as stone. And when that happens... You could not hear the instruction or the messages. Well, you, some people, they just take themselves totally away from the instruction and the messages of the Lord of Heaven's armies had, that he had sent, how? Through his spirit, through the prophets. This is why the Lord of Heaven's armies became so angry with him. Why was he so angry? Because they wouldn't listen. Even though the spirit was in the prophets in the word, they wouldn't listen. 13. Since they refused to listen when I called to them, I would not listen when they called to me, said the Lord of heaven's armies. And as with a whirlwind, I scattered them among the distant nations. So if Jerusalem was the promised land, what made them leave the promised land? Well, you could say God scattered them. You could say Nebuchadnezzar drugged them off. But no, 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 no. What really scattered them? Hard hearts. No listening. See, the root of the scattering wasn't the war. The root of the scattering was they wouldn't listen. And what about today, in America today? What will be the, what will be the end of the nation? There will be an end to the nation. You won't listen. The Holy Spirit, through the prophets, the preaching of the word today, they won't listen. Hard hearts. A scattering. As with a whirlwind, I scattered them among the distant nations where they lived as strangers. Their land became so desolate that no one even traveled through it. They turned the pleasant land into a desert. What? Hard hearts, not listening. Why won't you listen or obey the Word of God? Why wouldn't they then? Why won't they now? Why, why won't you listen? Because it, is, it offends you. It offends me. I remember several years ago hearing Kyle Eidemann do a sermon, and he said every time you open the Word of God, it offends him. And I thought, why don't we just admit it? Because I agree with Kyle. Every time I open the Word of God, it offends me because it shows me who I really am, not who I think I am, not who I want to be, but who am I in contrast to the absolute power and authority of the Word of God. So you know what? If you don't open it, you're not offended. But then your heart grows hard, 
and you lose the ability to listen. You see, this is the ultimate issue then and today. Will you listen? And then secondly, after listening, will you obey? You see, they knew what God desired then, and so do people today. The question is, will people honor and obey the Word of God? Will people honor and obey the Word of God as authoritative? The people were mourning and fasting the destruction of Jerusalem, but the real reason for the destruction was what? Willful, willful disobedience against the Word of God. I want, I want to make a big point of this. Willful, not accidental, not because you didn't know, willful disobedience of the Word of God. Do we have an issue today? Willful disobedience of the Word of God. Will the people follow human traditions or God's Word? Human traditions... God's Word. <coughs> this question started with Zechariah with them saying, should we continue fasting on the anniversary of the Jerusalem temple's fall? God's response could have been, well, I didn't tell you to do that in the first place. That became your tradition. You know how many churches have fallen due to traditions? People will follow man-made traditions. In fact, I'm kind of blown away by the authority of man-made traditions. Let me give you a crazy story, really crazy story. It happened years ago, and I'll try to be tactful in telling the story, but it was in uh, a church. <laughs> That's as tactful as I can be. It's in a church, and the church, you've seen them, you've been in churches. We used to have one here a long, 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 long time ago. There's this little white board up front, and after every time they'd throw an offering or they'd take attendance, they'd, they'd go up and they'd put the little numbers on the little white board. They'd say, today's attendance and today's offering and today's something. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with the board. It's a board, Okay. Well, in this particular church several years ago, I happened to be there during this particular time. I have first-hand information on this, and that board had been there, I guess, since Noah. Um, there's a board. They got the attendance, and, and there was a decision made to move the board. They didn't even take the board down uh, for good. They just moved the board from the front of the building because they'd changed some stuff around, and they were going to put it at kind of at the exit of the building. You could still see it when you were going out. And there was a guy in the church who blew up. I mean, he blew up. He said that if that wasn't back up there next Sunday, he'd never be back to church. They didn't put him back. Here's the point. Man-made traditions. People will follow man-made traditions. I look at how many things in the church that God didn't initiate that people now won't let go of. But you put in something that God said absolutely do or not do, and people ignore it, and their heart grows hard. Man-made traditions. God does something in this. Then he reveals the future glory. And we're going to go to chapter 8 now, verse 1. So, so hold in your mind what just was asked and how God answers it. And God, in the middle of that, he reveals future glory, which is a picture of his sovereign grace. I'm really happy he has grace. In verse 1, chapter 8, Zechariah says, Then another message came to me from the Lord of heaven's armies. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says, My love for Mount Zion is passionate. And strong, and I am consumed with passion for Jerusalem. Now, pause, pause, pause. What? God tells Zechariah in the middle of this discussion of a bunch of people who have been scattered across the world and now they've been brought back to Jerusalem and they're trying to rebuild the walls and they're trying to rebuild the temple. And in the middle of that scene, they're asking, should we be fasting or not fasting? God says, my love for Jerusalem for Mount Zion is passionate and strong, and I am consumed with passion for this city. Verse 3, And now the Lord says, I am returning to Mount Zion. I will live in Jerusalem. Now what does that mean? What are they building the temple for? What is a temple? It's a house of God, right? I am returning to Mount Zion. I, am, I will live in Jerusalem. 
Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. The mountain of the Lord of heaven's armies will be called the holy mountain. Before Nebuchadnezzar comes, God leaves. And God now says, I am so passionate about this place that I want to come and live there. And I want to live there forever. And I want to live in the middle of your people forever. This is my passion. This is my desire. I am consumed with this issue of coming and living in your presence. I really wonder what people who refuse to acknowledge that Jesus will ever set foot on the present earth do with the book of Zechariah. Because I know a lot of people, and I don't don't want to make a point out of this, and just because somebody says they don't believe Jesus will ever stand on the earth again, that we'll just all be taken up to heaven, and this place burns up in a fire. I just wonder what you do with the book of Zechariah. That's my only question. What do you do with the book of Zechariah? You'd have to tear out that book. God's love for Jerusalem is not an accident, it's not an afterthought. He says pretty clearly that I love Mount Zion. I'm passionate and I'm strong, I'm consumed with this place. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why, because if you don't get this, you're going to miss the purpose of the Messiah in the short term. In the short term. God told Abraham to take his son Isaac. Who's the first Jew? The first Israelite, the first Hebrew. Who is he? His name's Abraham. God comes to Abraham after he's made this covenant, this promise, eternal promise. Abraham didn't start this. God started it. Because God sees the end from the beginning. And he calls this one guy, one guy, from one man, he's going to create this entire plan. He calls Abraham and he tells Abraham to take his son Isaac, the son of the promise, the covenant son of Isaac, take him to a specific place called Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there. Now, you and I know today that Mount Moriah would be the place we now would call the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount, the house of God place. The presence of God on planet Earth place. But before there's a house of God, before there's a temple, before there's any Jews... Well, there's two, Abraham and Isaac. He tells Abraham to take Isaac to Mount Moriah and raise a knife and shed his blood. Let me read it, Genesis 22, 2. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Don't miss it. Go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Which mountain do you think God will show Abraham? Do you think Abraham's trying to guess, well, I wonder where they'll build the temple. No, God knows where they'll build the temple. He's sovereign. He has absolute authority. So he knows one day, God sees the future, there will be a a temple that David will build, he'll, I mean, excuse me, that Solomon will build. And he sees the future, if you were here last week, you know, he sees the future of a millennial temple that Jesus will build. But roll backwards, and here's Abraham with his son Isaac and some rocks and some wood and some fire and a knife. And he's on the place on Mount Moriah where one day his own glory will descend on the earth. King David, you know the story that God says, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, now know that you truly fear me. And he creates a preview of what will happen through Jesus the Messiah. That God will not withhold his own son. And his son, this time the knife will not be spared, but this time his blood will be shed on Calvary, outside the city, outside the gates of Jerusalem. But hold that thought. King David, we go from Abraham on Mount Moriah with Isaac to King David purchasing a threshing floor called Mount Moriah. And he offers a sacrifice there that stopped a plague. David had issued an order to take a census, and it was against the law of God. God didn't want the people to be strong because they knew how many people were in their army. He wanted the people to be strong because they knew Yahweh, Jehovah. So David did a census, and God became angry, and people started dying in a plague. Verse 18, 2 Samuel 24, that day... 
Gad came to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aronah, the Jebusite. So David went up to do what the Lord had commanded him. When Aaronic saw the king and his men coming toward him, he came and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Why have you come, my lord the king? Aaronic asked David. Ask. David replied, I have come to buy your threshing floor and <clears throat> to build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. Take it, my lord the king, and use it as you wish, Aaronic said to David. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and you can use the threshing boards and the ox yokes for wood to build a fire and an altar. I will give it all to you. Listen, I will give it to you, Aaronic is willing to give the king this piece of property and the oxen and the wood and the fire. I'll give it to you. But no. The king replied to Aaronic, No, I insist on buying it, for I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. What, what, what was the offering that took place there before? Isaac was Abraham's son. So David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen. David built an altar there to the Lord and his sacrifice, burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer for the land and the plague on Israel stopped. What stopped death that day? An event on the temple mount called Mount Moriah. It stopped death. You might say there's no mention in this text of the threshing floor that David bought was Mount Moriah. But wait. There isn't there, but it is. King Solomon, David's son, built the first Jewish temple there on Mount Moriah. And if you want to connect the dots, you'll find it in 2 Chronicles 3.1. So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Do you wonder, was that where David was? Where the Lord had appeared to David his father, the temple was built on the threshing floor of Aranach, the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. The construction began in mid-spring during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. Now, look at what God says about this place called Mount Moriah where Abraham, David, and Solomon stood. What's so special? What makes it? Is it, is it special because Abraham did that to Isaac? Hmm. Is it special because that's where David killed some oxen, set them on fire? Hmm. Is it special because Solomon built the building there? Why is it special? Listen, you got to get this to get this. Second Chronicles six one. <laughs> Solomon, and by the way, let me give you the context. Solomon has now been, built this temple under the specific instructions and plans of God on a specific place, Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Then Solomon prayed, "O Lord." You have said that you would live in a thick cloud of darkness. Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a place where you can live forever. Then the king turned to the entire community of Israel standing before him and gave this blessing. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept the promise he made to my father David. For he told my father, from the day I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have never, I have never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as a place where a temple should be built to honor my name. So pause for a moment. What was the tabernacle? It was where God dwelt among the people in a mobile tent. And God told David, Uh, From the day I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as a place where where a temple should be built in the honor of my name. Nor have I chosen a king to lead my people Israel. But now, but now, I'm choosing. I have chosen Jerusalem as a place, listen, listen, for my name. What? His name. I've chosen Jerusalem. So when you hear the word out loud, Jerusalem, his name. God has attached his name to Jerusalem. Read again, verse 6. Now I have chosen Jerusalem as the place for my name to be honored. And I have chosen David to be king over my people Israel. Forever. Forever. David. David. There's one before David, 
that brings David, that will follow David. His name is Jesus. Psalms 132. Why, why, why Mount Moriah? Why, why all the fuss about what's going on, Zechariah and the rebuilding the temple? Why all the fuss? Psalms 132, verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He has desired it for his home. He's going to live there. This is my resting place forever. I will live there. For this is the home I desired. I will bless this city and make it prosperous. I will satisfy, satisfy its poor with food. I will clothe its priests with godliness. Its faithful servants will sing for joy. Here I will increase the power of David. My anointed one will be a light for my people. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but he will be a glorious king. He's referring to David, but he's actually referring to the one that will come before David to bring David to follow David. You know who he is? He's the branch. His name's Jesus. The branch, the king, the savior, the ruler of the house of Jacob forever. Fast forward from Zechariah to Chronicles to Psalms to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Just so happened to be a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you will give him the name Jesus. Here comes the prophecies. He will be great. You give him the name Jesus. You can check that one off. It's done. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High God. You can check that one off. It's done. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, he's given him the throne, but he's not seated there yet. But he will be. David's throne is not in heaven. David's throne is in Jerusalem. Next prophecy, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. When that reign begins, when he sits on David's throne and establishes a kingdom authority reign as a priest and a king in the same person, how long will the term last? Does he get four years, six years? Is there going to be another election? Forever, forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel. I'm a virgin. God doesn't need us. He can do anything. With God, everything's possible. So what's coming? Now, I've said all of that to be able to come back to Zechariah, verse 4 through 8. This is what, what's coming. What's coming? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Once again, old men and women will walk Jerusalem streets with their canes and sit together in the city squares. <coughs> And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls at play. Now you might say, well, that's been fulfilled. That was fulfilled when uh, they came back and rebuilt the city. Hmm. Okay, yeah, it was. It was a preview of what I believe is the coming event. That, you could say it's fulfilled now since 1948 when Israel's a nation again. Yep, yeah, I agree. There's kids playing in the streets there, yeah. But keep going, keep going. So, is this all finished? Verse 6, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. All this may seem impossible to you now, small remnant of God's people. But is it impossible for me, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. And I want you to pause for a moment and ask a question. If you read the Bible, all the way, read the Bible before 1948, what would you think about the fa fact that Israel, one day there'd be a temple there, and one day there'd be Jews in Jerusalem living, playing in the street? Before 1948, you can't imagine that. But in 1948, something happened that can only happen by the power of God, which I believe to be a preview of the final power of God manifest in Jerusalem. He reestablished a people in that place. And in 1967, during that six-day war, Israel took possession of Mount Moriah. Verse 6, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. 
All this may seem impossible to you now, a small remnant of God's people, but is it impossible for me, says the Lord of Heaven's armies? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. You can be sure that I will rescue my people from the east and from the west. They, I will regather the peoples of the earth. I will bring them home again to live safely in Jerusalem. They will be my people and I will be faithful. And I will be faithful and just toward them as their God. But before that day could happen, the people of Zechariah's day would need to do something. They were going to, I'm talking back to 520 B.C., they would need to rebuild the walls. Zechariah 8, 8 through 19. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says, be strong, finish the task. Ever since the laying of the foundation of the temple of the Lord of Heaven's armies, you have heard what the prophets have been saying about completing the building before the work on the temple began. There were no jobs, no money to hire people or animals. No traveler was safe from the enemy, for there are enemies on all sides. I had turned everyone against each other, but now. God was doing something then, but now I will not treat the remnant of my people as I treated them before, says the Lord of heaven's armies, for I am planting seeds of peace and prosperity among you. When? In 520 B.C., when they're coming back, they're rebuilding, I'm planting seeds of prosperity and peace among you. The grapevines will be heavy with fruit. The earth will produce its crops. The heavens will release the dew. Once more, I will cause the remnant of Judah and Israel to inherit the blessing. Among the other nations, Judah and Israel became symbols of a cursed nation. What? To Persia, they cursed the Jews. The Babylonians, they cursed the Jews. Among other nations, Judah and Israel became symbols of a cursed nation, but no longer. What happens? Well, you know what anti Semitism is today? It's when the nations of the world curse the Jews. This is a preview, but no more. Now I will rescue and make you both a symbol and a source of blessing. So don't be afraid. Be strong and get on with rebuilding the temple. He's talking about back in 520 B.C. For this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says, I was determined to punish you when your ancestors angered me. And I did not change my mind, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, but now. Did he punish them? Yeah. Did he scatter them? Yes. But now, I am determined, I am determined to bless Jerusalem and the people of Judah, so don't be afraid. But this is what you must do. Tell the truth to each other. Render verdicts in your courts that are just and that lead to peace. Don't scheme against each other. Stop your love of telling lies that you swear are the truth. I hate all the things, all these things, says the Lord. And then listen, here's another message that came to me from the Lord of Heaven's armies. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says, the traditional fasts and times of mourning you have kept in early summer, midsummer, autumn, and winter are now Ended. You know how we started tonight? They were asking a question. Should we continue this fast we do at the anniversary of the temple's fall? He says, the traditional fast are now ended. They will become instead festivals of joy and celebration for the people of Judah. So, love truth. Is this grace and mercy? Stop being sad. That's over. I'm wanting to bless you. I'm giving you grace and mercy. So love truth and peace. Finally, one glimpse into the future and we'll close tonight. The last three verses, Zechariah 8, 20 through 23. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says. <laughs> I love this picture. One of these days, one of these days, this is going to happen. People from nations and cities around the world will travel to Jerusalem. Now, now I want to tell you, to do that before 1948 would probably be not the same. It was occupied under Britain for many years and part of uh, you know previous empires. But well, let me say this, in 2010 I had this wonderful privilege to go to Israel. 
So I read verse 20 from a very specific perspective. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. People from nations and cities around the world will travel to Jerusalem. When I was on that bus and we rounded the curve up to where I first, for the first time, overlooked the city of Jerusalem, looked at the city, my heart was beating so fast. I don't know why. Just, just I was so moved. This is the throne of God. This is the place where he will live forever. This is the place that is his name. Man didn't choose that. Man didn't decide that. God said that. And I'm here. I, I get to come here. I get to see it. Verse 21, the people of one city will say to the people of another city, come with us to Jerusalem and ask the Lord to bless us. Do you know what we did there? And let me tell you, some of you know that uh, Eddie Webster and I, I had printed out a list of every name of every person in the church at that time in 2010. Every name. I'd printed every name I could come up with in the church. And Eddie Webster and I d um, divided the paper in two. And we went to the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. And at the Western Wall, leaning against the Western Wall, Eddie and I prayed out loud for every name in this church from Jerusalem. I'll never forget that day. The people of one city will say to the people of another, come with us to Jerusalem and ask the Lord to bless us. Let's worship the Lord of heaven's armies. I'm determined to go. Many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord of heaven's armies and ask for his blessing. And listen, here's my favorite thing tonight. Verse 23, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies says in those days. And this day's coming. This day's coming. In those days, 10 men from different nations and languages of the world will clutch at the sleeve of one Jew. And they will say, please let us walk with you. For we have heard that God is with you. Now listen, church. God is with the people of Israel. The church did not replace Israel. But here's the good news tonight. The church was invited by God to join Israel. The adoption. That God has broken off some branches and given the church, the Gentiles, a place to be connected to Abraham's seed. Tonight we celebrate. We celebrate that the God who is passionate toward Jerusalem is passionate for us living on the other side of the globe, the church. He calls us his bride. We did not replace Israel. Washington, D.C. has not replaced Jerusalem. But listen, those who are in Christ have been invited to join this family. Tonight, we celebrate that invitation into the family of God, into the children of Abraham. Thank you for being here tonight.